Okay. I believe we have the same motion. With that out of the way, I think we can invite the Prime Minister and good luck to everyone in the round. Yeah, yeah. Timestamps will be indicated in the chat space. Um, I think Raymond will handle that. Raymond or one of the panelists. Thank you. Um, Vincent, I am piping with my phone, so it'd be hard for me to like take note of the time on the phone as well at the same time. I'm taking notes okay. on the phone. Okay. Um, any of the panelists who can do that? Because I'm also typing with the PC, so it won't be easy for me to set up. Um, Collins, can you do that? Or Toby or Vanik? All right, so Collins will be indicating the timestamps on the chat space. Otherwise, we welcome the Prime Minister here. here. All right, my audible. <clears throat> yes, you're audible. Okay, please give me a moment to set my timer, put myself in order. Uh, okay. Oh my God. All right. Right. Um, I'll be starting my speech. <clears throat> I'll be starting my speech in three, two, one. Panel, I think it's very important from open government for us to interrogate what individual um self interest looks like. We think that individual self interest are things that I that affect or things that have to do with their immediate wants and their futuristic needs. We also need to understand that individual self um interest um exists within the civil confines it means that at the end of the day we should not get something from you know um, from opposition about how um when people prioritize their self-interest they begin to do a whole lot of things simply because they feel it's in their self-interest we think for something to be a self-interest it has to be within the confines mm -hmm. of the civil liberty um the civil, um, the civil confines, because of course it's in your self-interest to not want to go to jail or to not want to be seen as a bad person within society. We think practically it looks like, you know, getting a job and um, making a priority to save for yourself or your children in future, or rather than um, giving to the poor or um, donating or something of such. But then secondly, what is the idea of elevating global suffering? We think that elevating universal global suffering is beyond an in we think the way it looks like is making the cause of particular problems to stop. For you to alleviate something, it means you are not mitigating that thing, you are not controlling it, but you are making that particular thing to stop. We think at the end of the day, the reason why we think that individuals should not should not prioritize this over their self-interest is because <clears throat> it's because. Um, it's beyond individual capacity to do due to the complexity of its causality factors in the first place. For example, improvisement um, or, 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 uh, or terrorism or cause for things like corruption or cause for things like um, 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 bandits and all of that. These are things that are far more than individual capacity to do. Because we think from opposition bench, they will have to justify to us why one person choosing, um, uh, why one person not choose prioritizing themselves, we all of a sudden mean things like world hunger will stop or things like world insecurity will stop in the first place. But even if, right, <clears throat> they should prioritize universal suffering, um, <clears throat> to the extent where the benefit you get from it is just contributing to mitigating the problems or the harms and not really solving the root problems, we think at the end of the day, it is something that is very problematic at the end of the day. If you should say that you contribute to, for example, a food bank because you want to alleviate food and world hunger, to the extent where whatever you contribute is maybe just sufficient to feed like 10 people in two days, and the problem of maybe corruption within that particular country or famine or drought still exists, we think to a very large extent, it is some a reason why individuals are not justified to do this, part, um, to prioritize um, alleviating universal suffering in the end of the day. 
the impact to this is individuals who most likely give up. That is the reason why in status quo, you have situations where most people who have this incentive to donate are big billionaires or you know, um, big corporations. And even at that, they have to do, make plans towards donating. They also have to get incentive like tax break for them to be able to do it in the first place. It just shows essentially how at the end of the day, we think that is the causal problems that should be focused on and not just alleviating it at that point in time. <clears throat> um, CO, your POI. Uh, even if we like completely lose this case to you, all you have proven is that individuals don't have the capacity to tangibly create changes. The motion tells you to show why it's justified for them to not have any obligation to alleviate universal suffering. It didn't ask you to prove they cannot do this. All right, maybe then you should wait when I was done and not really when I was in the middle of my speech. Yeah, thank you. All right, the reason why we think that something should be justified in the first place or why, um, um, why the reason why we think that um, it, it is not justified, it is justified for them to prioritize their self-interest is simply because they are not the cause of these particular problems. We think that to the extent where they are not directly culpable for the problems of this particular of the problems of the world, it means that um, that is the reason. But then even people who don't do it in opposition's world will most likely be vilified as enemies of the state. And then it exonerates people or exonerates the causal effect at the end of the day. And that is so, the reason why we say that self-interest should always be prioritized. Because the moment when you begin to justify prioritizing opposition's world, it means all this vilification we all call, and then we exonerate things like the government, things like the terrorists, things like mismanagement and all of that that exist. But then, in our own world, what would this prioritization look like? We think mm -hmm. at the point where people have um, lean resources, they should prioritize themselves at the end of the day. We also think that it is not a duty for them to be prioritizing things that is not a direct cost to themselves. Their main mm -hmm. duty at the end of the day is to take care of themselves, which is why they should always take care, which is why they should always prioritize their self-interest at the end of the day. We think that why we, this is very important is because one, the, we, the, the reason why we have things like government or the reason why we have um, leaders within our society is for them to take care of all these particular things within the, pro, um, within the society, to take care of world problems at the end of the day. To the extent where we say that they should prioritize world um, problems over their own self-interest, it means we shift the duty from the government or leaders for them to do it. This is bad for individuals or bad for citizens within particular states. We also think that it is bad for um it is bad for the government because it's an attack on their relevance within society and a, an attack on their hegemony. Because the moment when citizens begin to do things that are the duty of governments within society, then it means that it will be very difficult for the government to have control and to have relevance within that society. We've shown you from our speech today, the reason as to why individuals in themselves are not the causal effect of whatever world problem it is. So it means they most likely don't have a control on how to alleviate it in the first place. It also means that it's not justified for them to take opposition stance because of course they'll most likely get tired with it. But even if they don't get tired with it, it is something that they cannot do individually because they have no capacity to get better engagement from my partner's speech. All right, I thank the PM for that very fine speech. Um, uh, just a reminder to other speakers or other observers in the room, please mute your mics and so that you don't interrupt the speeches that are flowing. Otherwise, I invite the LO to begin opposition's case. Yeah, here. Um, can everyone see and hear me? Yes, clearly. All right, um, POIs in the chat, please. I'll make sure to take at least one before the sixth minute. Um, but please don't interrupt me in the middle of my speech. Just leave it in the chat and I'll get to you at some point. All right, starting my speech in three, 
Two clarifications at the top of the speech. Firstly, where does this debate take place? This debate takes place where people have the capacity to make a trade-off, because obviously, if people do not have the capacity to begin with, they're not obviously making a choice whether to prioritize one thing over the other. What does this capacity look like? Look like? It looks like one, having enough resources. So for instance, when you don't, when you have like enough capacity to use resources for either the betterment of yourself or for the betterment of others or the like alleviation of universal suffering in general that's where this debate takes, takes place this question of where you would use those resources but secondly it's where is your own individual suffering oftentimes is non-existent or is at least minimized to, to a large degree where oftentimes individuals aren't suffering themselves and therefore don't have don't have to use the resources to alleviate their own suffering it's a question of whether you use additional resources to make yourself happier than that as opposed to alleviating the suffering of others Secondly, then, what does the alleviation of universal suffering actually look like? Because obviously, we're not asking people to completely solve world poverty. We obviously don't expect that, that burden to be placed on individuals. Like, that is absurd. But what people can do is contribute to reducing such suffering and making the world a better place. So, for instance, it looks like donating to, to World Bank, like, food banks, for instance, to ensure that people aren't starving on the street, or at least at least one more person or 10 more people are fed, as opposed to feeding yourself expensive sushi, for instance, because that costs a lot more. It looks like um, be being willing to join movements and taking the time to join social movements to, imp to improve conditions for women or to improve conditions for racial minorities, sexual minorities, etc. even when you aren't part of that group, that minority group, because you understand that those people are suffering from oppression and that that is un un unjust and that you ought to use your time for those things. That, I think, is still reasonable. It is uh, contributing to alleviating suffer universal suffering. It obviously doesn't solve the problem immediately, but it makes conditions for people a lot worse, a lot better than, in the, than they otherwise would be in. If anything's not clear at this point, I'm happy to take a point of information, unless that's the case. I'm going to move on to my substantive material. The first thing I want to talk about is how why we think individual self-interest is just oftentimes undeserved. The first thing to say here is that oftentimes the ability for you to enjoy your self-interest is an outcome of just pure luck, and therefore it's not something that you innately deserve or are entitled to. Because being into an affluent environment, a well-providing, emotionally supportive family, a particular skin color or gender that grants you privilege in literally every step of your life, is not something that is the outcome of something that you've done well. It is an outcome of absolutely just pure luck, pure birth lottery, where you, by circumstance or by mere coincidence, were born into that privilege. And all those things that allow you to therefore pursue your self-interest because you have those additional resources granted to you as a result of those things are granted to you simply because you're lucky enough to be born into that circumstance. As opposed to that, many people are denied of those basic things for the very simple reason that they were, again, unlucky. Why is this important? Because it means that oftentimes you aren't entitled to the privileges that you enjoy. You are not entitled to the self-interest that you want to pursue. And likewise, other people are not unentitled to this very same things that you enjoy. Other people are not unentitled to the alleviation of basic suffering or to the like the provision of just basic necessities like food and water like and shelter that they ought to deserve and they would have received if they had just been as lucky as you. Why is this important? Because even if we were to concede that opening government is right in saying that you probably weren't the cause of all, a lot of that suffering, it doesn't matter because insofar as you understand that you are benefiting off of these things, but other people are not, then, but other people deserve those same things as, as well, you ought to have an obligation to ensure that other people aren't being deprived of those things purely because they are unlucky. And for that reason alone, you ought to ensure that you are, you are to recognize that you are not entitled to those things and you ought to give those things but to the people that are as entitled to you at, for those things, but do not, are not receiving that. The second thing I would say here then is that the many things that people enjoy, especially in developed environments where often where most of these people who oftentimes are affluent enough to use those resources to either like improve their self-interest or like alleviate uh, alleviate um, universal suffering is a consequence of a historical plunder of the, the least the current least developing states in which the least developed states in which most of the universal suffering does happen. And because like for instance, oftentimes the reason why people are suffering in least developed countries isn't because these people were just innately terrible at making their their ends meet. It often is, is because these people had their had everything stolen away from them through plunder through colonial colonialism and they were never able to re properly recover from that instance. And what this means is that given that you are a benefactor of that historical injustice that took place, and you currently are still benefiting off of that, and the reason why you're able to enjoy the all these luxuries that you would enjoy, that you are enjoying, and like the they, you're enjoying the, the per, like pursuit of self-interest as a result of those things necessarily means that you have an obligation to provide to those that are continuing to suffer from that very same historical injustice. Because the reason why you're able to live an affluent life or you are able to pursue your self-interest is because those people are suffering right now. You have an obligation to those people. The final thing I say is that the enjoyment of self, individual self-interest is oftentimes complacent to the structures that cause universal suffering. This looks like buying products from and consumers, consumers goods from MNCs that exploit labor and therefore by 
but providing those corporations that money, you allow those people, corporations to continue this, that suffering to, and continue those practices and continue to cause suffering. Literally, the reason why that suffering is therefore happening is because you're allowing that to happen and because you're complacent. I think in, at this point, you are a cause of that suffering. You are you have an obligation to correct, to correct for that. Before I move on to the next point, I'll take the point of information. Okay, so is it illegal for me to have money and decide not to donate it? It's a simple what? Um. I, I didn't get the last part of the speech, the, the POI, but like it's not illegal, but it's still a moral, moral wrong and, and you still have an obligation not to do it, right? The second thing I say is that individual self-interest also causes disproportionate scale of harm to others. The first thing I say here is that oftentimes your action of self-interest quite often directly relate to a large scale, larger scale of harm, and therefore this is bad. This looks like turning on the air conditioning when you feel that your room is kind of a bit stuffy, which might be a slight inconvenience to you, but it causes contributes to far greater suffering to a much larger number of people and larger scale of suffering in terms of actually interesting li livelihoods by, co by contributing to global warming and climate change. I would argue that this also looks like, for instance, ignoring social movements because you think that like joining social movements is a nuisance and a bit of a hassle and because it doesn't relate to you. When oftentimes the outcome of those social movements being ignored is that structures of discrimination and oppression are continued to allow to exist. Those, your pri pr like prioritization of small self-interest oftentimes lead to far greater suffering. And even if it's not the case that it directly leads to that suffering, often it's the fact that resources are limited means that you cause that, that suffering by depriving other people of that, those same resources. When, for instance, you choose to use your, use your money to buy luxury goods, that same amount of money that would have given you a small about the like, margin of happiness could have been used to provide other like a larger number of people with basic necessities, far more food, far more shelter, and far more water, which all things are a lot cheaper than luxury goods and therefore could have been larger in scale. And the reason this is always true is because universal suffering necessarily involves a fundamental deprivation of basic necessities, which are basic to provide for in comparison to like the smallest like um, enjoyment that you get from like self-interest, which often are expensive and therefore could play for a lot more of those necessities. The scale of suffering that it is caused on, on that side of the house is far greater and it's kind of, is something that it cannot be justifiable. The final thing I'd say is that like individual self-interest is also just oftentimes a lot less certain. Like if you're pre pre preparing for the future by saving up, the benefit of that is far less certain than, for instance, providing food and shelter to people immediately. We think we ought to prioritize immediate suffering where people are oftentimes are immediately better off as opposed to something that's just ambiguous and untangible at the moment. So proud to oppose. All right, I thank the hello for that fine speech and now I invite the DPM to conclude coming case. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm coming, panel. It's actually raining here, so I'm trying to get a um, very stable network. All right, so um, am I audible and um, Yeah, but you're not so clear. Maybe could you make a longer statement so that we can know. Okay, so um, QID text this. Ah, so use it once to ask if you like, because I'm not looking at the text space. Um, um, um fine. Then, Am I audible guys? Yes, you're audible, but not very clear, but yeah, I think we can work with that. It's actually raining here and I don't know if I can get a bit back to yeah. Okay, so um am I better now? Yes, much better. All right, cool, thanks. So, um, uh, just hold on, guys. I bet. Okay, I bet. Let me use your room. I'll use Okay, cool. So, um, I believe I'm audible and then I'm visible. So, I'm going to be starting yes. my screen. Okay, yeah, for POI, any problem? <laughs> 
You're good. Very clear. Oh, cool. All right. Cool. So um, for pure wise, please um, just unmute by the fifth minute. I believe there are 10 stamps in the text space. So just unmute yourself in the fifth minute and then ask your wife. Um, I would like to prioritize some closing opposition. All right. Um, just before I start my speech, I want to dedicate this speech to uh, my partner, um, Esther. It's really been a good run with you. And then I also want to dedicate to my fans and uh, my guys at Win or Beam. And then to every quality um, educator out there, you guys are really doing a lot to keep this sport um, going. I really, really appreciate you guys. Regardless of the outcome, you guys will always still be the best ever. So let's start this debate, guys. So um, in three, two, one. We think that the idea of prioritization means three things, and I will show you why those things are important. The first is that one, you prioritize at the point where you have many resources and then you choose to side with yourself. But then two, you prioritize because you have brilliant resources and then you choose to share, um, let's say 40% of that particular resources, right, with um, towards solving universal problems and then you keep 60% to yourself. But then three, at a point where there are public movement, social justice movement, government policies that naturally talks about things like um, humanitarian goals or universal problem, we choose to do two things. One, assess all of these policies to see whether they have any particular benefit to you in immediate, in, in, what, in its immediate effect and also in its futuristic term. At a point where there is no particular return to this particular thing, the idea of prioritization means that individuals from outside of the house of opening government stand to defend their own particular interests against solving universal issues. This priority is important. Why? It means that even if you necessarily want to give back to like society in terms of people that are suffering, people that are hungry, people that are homeless, we think that individuals can still do that on our own side. But then even regardless of the idea of prioritization, right, funny. We think in principle there are three measures at which individuals naturally contribute to alleviating the suffering that exists in the worldwide spectrum, and I will mechanize it to you. The first is when they vote in responsible government that is able to initiate better policies that caters for the interests of the minorities and the people that are suffering in this particular society. Through the establishment and the fulfillment of their particular obligation, they have already done enough to contribute to alleviating the suffering that exists in their society. In the global spectrum, when they vote in the responsible government that understand the impact of international, international diplomacy and global cooperation, it also means that you're able to provide a government that allows for things like um, contributions of resources towards things like IMF, towards things like World Health Organization, towards things like UNICEF, that still helps to solve the bigger world problems in the bigger spectrum in itself. But then three, we think to an extent where there is this particular intrinsic human nature that calls for things like sympathy and empathy from people within their particular society. That in itself is enough mechanism for humans to always reach out to the poor around them, even if they don't necessarily have to like borrow form to do all of those things. We think individuals in principle and also by the idea of prioritization are already doing enough. Let's engage opening opposition. Three things, and I'm gonna be taking this burden panel as a big concession. Let's assume that these guys have the capacity to do so. Like these guys are rich individuals. Why do we think they should not still prioritize that? Two reasons. On the first principle, we think that individuals should be left with the legitimate right to optimize their particular income, regardless of the problem that, are, that surrounds them. Opening opposition say, oh, these people are um, these people are responsible for the problem that is happening, so they have to necessarily give back to that. Two reasons to that. One, that is a lie. But then two, we think that the individuals that are majorly responsible are government that make nonsensical policies that mostly affect these particular minorities in this particular society. Meaning in their own side of the house, you only spread that particular culpability to individuals that are not directly responsible in the first place. But then second, engaging the idea of escorting these people of those particular flaws, it also means that you don't even give a checkmate mechanism for the real individuals that are culpable to be held accountable. So you channel attention to like um, helpless individuals in this particular society. In the own side of the house, what they preach is that you use humans as a means to an end. 
The problem with that on the longer run is that individuals that sort of amass wealth for themselves in terms of their business prospect and enterprise, so an enterprise begins to be vilified because they are seeing the rising within the society as an oppression on the poor in that particular society. If, even if that's like a biggest burden from outside of the house, we think we justify because the way capitalism naturally works is that they deliver services, they deliver needs to this particular society. So even if they are amassing through the poor, we think they naturally, like, it's, it's something that justifies, like, their income in itself. It is not free. Like, that's business. But then because they also want to remain in business, things like corporate social responsibility allow corporations to still give back to that particular society that puts them in the first place. This body naturally takes opening oppositions again. Let's engage another idea in this debate. The idea of like universal problem and what this is characterizing. And even if individuals have like capacity to do so, why do we think that it is not enough? Before I go ahead, CO, do you have any POI? CO? Yes, yes. So let's say in yeah, a situation a person is approaching me with like a gun and all I have is a stick. Do you think in that particular situation, I do not have the right to self-defense? If your POI is all about the idea that ah, you need to defend yourself in all situations, we think that's what we are doing in our side of the house. Because when you prioritize self-interest, it means you're able to evaluate the harms that necessary want to come to you and understand the mechanisms you have to forestall all of those things. But this debate should not be about the comparative of gun and stick sort of comparative. That's nonsensical. Panel notice that the idea that universal problems should be something that individuals should be actively involved in engaging is very, very problematic in all ways that these guys must, let, must tell you. This is why. We think that the complexity of the causality factors to the um, universal problems in itself is something that is beyond individuals' capacity to naturally solve in the root causes in itself. Why this is important and why you guys should care about it is because in opening government, we naturally support a world where the root cause of all these particular things are majorly targeted in the, like their need in the board. Because what happens in the outside of the house is that even when you coerce people to prioritize universal sufferings in itself, in as much as that particular contribution is not holding the real actors in themselves that are culpable, the real um, what's called causality factors in terms of solving it, you only put these people in perpetual struggling in time to meet up in, 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 in the bid to meet up with social standard to solve problems in itself. We think that is immoral because you limit individuals' rights to be better self-actualized and prioritize what is best for them. But then in principle, because when push comes to short, what should naturally be prioritized in this particular instance is your own survival as human beings. Because even your once in a while sort of giving to your own society is, is possible because of the idea that you are able to self-sustain in the long-term measure. We think it is best, why? Because the idea of justification means that you don't necessarily like remove the particular culpability for individuals that are responsible for these things, but then you leave individuals with the objective means to choose whether or not to give to people. Meanwhile, prioritizations in the outside of the house take care for these people indirectly and also in principle. Everybody's so proud to propose. All right, I thank the DPM for that fine speech and for concluding government case. I invite the DLO to conclude opening case. Yeah, yeah. Hi, am I audible and visible? Yes, you are. All right, um, POIs in the chat. I don't take POIs verbally because I get distracted, but if you put them in the chat, I'll make sure to take one before six. This debate is not a policy debate. It's a normative debate. What that means is that what we have to pr prove from opening opposition is not to envision a world in which we illegalize a particular action, but it's more about the question as to what are we going to, what do we see as a moral justification? Is it morally okay for individuals to prioritize their self-interest over the alleviation of universal suffering to the extent to which if that is the case, I really don't see as to why on our side government will become complacent because it's the evaluatory debate as to what the status quo looks like and where do we draw the line of moral, like immoral legitimacy. They never prove to us to why that in that particular motion, their case should still stand, right? But I think that coming from the previous speaker, there was a bit of a contradiction, right? Because they say that already status quo is doing certain things like corporate social responsibility or people voting for certain governments, I think that if that is the case where those actions are the extension of people 
com like contributing to the alleviation of social, like, you know, universal suffering, then sure that those are things that we are willing to, you know, support on our side of the house. We never told you that these things are not okay or these things are morally, like, morally abhorrent, right? But their case also assumes on the idea that these things are enough when firstly, voting oftentimes leads to the, like, decision of, like, being, like, politicians like Trump being elected or they never explain why these things are quote-unquote enough when there are still problems like poverty or climate change happening. They never defended as to why the status quo or why like you know the status in the status quo like when people do prioritize their self-interest and electing in very like a foreign politician why that is something that is justified when the other candidates could have been much better right i think that that wasn't proven by the previous speaker just some couple of framings as to how this principle works, right? Number one, there are various ways in which you can contribute to the alleviation of suffering. Obviously, you can do things like monetary donation, but you can also do things like providing emotional comfort to people who are rejected. There are spectrums of ways in which we're able to make people or ways in which individuals are able to contribute to the alleviation of universal suffering. Insofar as that is true, government bench cannot reduce our cases like donation. There are so many ways in which individuals can contribute. That means that the access to this contribution is something that is like, you know, quite guaranteed for different types of individuals. But secondly, crucial framing that one bin tells you is that this is a prioritization motion. And therefore, this means that we're talking about people who have the ability to prioritize their self-interest. And oftentimes, what we're there for okay. So we're not like fundamentally going against the people pursuing their own basic necessities or things like bare minimum. Obviously, we're not pushing people to like starve to death. But what we are saying is when you have a money, when, when all your bare minimum and basic necessities are met and you still have surplus capital, we are not okay with individuals using that capital to pursue their self-interest. Like for example, like, you know, doing your hobby or for example, like eating sushis in the restaurant, when you could have used that capital in order to alleviate poverty, when you could have mitigated climate change, that's something that they had to defend, which they were not able to do so, right? But the the, but also, I think that a lot of like material that one been told you with regards to why there's greater urgency to alleviate your alleviate the universal suffering as opposed to you like simply going to certain restaurants or going to certain vacation. We think a lot of the times when it comes to the tangibility, our side is more important. But secondly, we told you also about the certainty because people's self interest always fluctuate over time. Sometimes you like certain things, but then your interest shifts or whatnot. So we think that there is a very speculative benefit when you prioritize your self interest as opposed to the point in which you prioritize the universal suffering that are quite certain as to what kind of sufferings that we're talking about. Obviously, that means that the certainty and urgency means that that metric means that the moral obligation for you to contribute stands, even if at the expense of your own self-interest. But the next thing that I also want to talk about is why do we think that individuals more often than not have a direct liability to the cost of social suffering that exists in the society, which is a direct response to opening government that people are not liable, right? Because I think that firstly, a lot of the times we, we live in a society that has a scarce resources. For example, things like the opportunity for you to enter certain university or for example, certain job opportunities are things that are limited. What that means is that the point in which you access to those opportunities, you lock out other individuals who could have gotten that particular opportunity as well, right? But secondly, your action oftentimes cause direct harm to others. What one being gave you as an example is for example, things like you using air conditioner and that, that how that automatically leads to the global warming or things like climate change that disproportionately harms things like, you know, context like developing countries. But third of all, you are oftentimes caused indirect harms, like for example, being complacent, you purchasing products from corporations that actively oppress laborers or cause climate change is also where you have indirect liability. So I would posit that more often than not, individuals are liable for one of the sufferings that exist. The way that I want to establish here is this. We don't have to prove that every individual is liable to all forms of universal suffering, because even when it comes to universal, universal, universal suffering, there are different types of universal suffering, right? So so what we have to prove then is structurally speaking, more often than not, individuals are liable to at least one of the universal suffering that exists in the society. And that means that you have the obligation to contribute. What does this mean that you're more, why does this mean that you're morally accountable then? We hold people accountable when your action directly causes harm regardless of your intention, right? But secondly, a lot of the times you know that these problems exist, right? Things like climate change, gender equality, poverty, these are things that are obviously existing. And we think that it's morally unjustified in which you knowingly like you know you knowingly enact those problems because i think that the notion of like good samaritan line which you are morally like culpable if you knowingly like omit certain things or do not contribute even if you know that those kind of sufferings exist this is something that we're principally not okay with i'll take a point from closing now
Colvin? Okay, you cannot simply just like you know put the whole idea of self-interest to just the background at that level. Engage how comes the harms that come, particularly when they lose that particular level of happiness that they derive from that particular self-interest in itself, is something that you generally have in your world as something that's a very negative impact. No, we're 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 not we're not fundamentally going against individuals, right? To pursue bare minimum, we're obviously not pushing people to start to that. That's something that I already said. You should have listened to my speech. My last reason as to why this means that you have a moral responsibility is that coming from open government, they say, well, people cannot solve entire problems. Firstly, they never explain why people cannot solve the entire problem. This was just an assertion. But secondly, I think that even if it is a mitigation, mitigation is still necessary, right? Because I think that, like, I think that open government just saying that, well, these are mitigation. It's just like insufficient because when we told you from opening opposition that the act or attempt to mediate those kind of suffering is also something that we always need, that means that there's a necessity for you to contribute. And in fact, them saying that government is like they support government action to, you know, like do a certain things to the universal suffering. Well, most government attempts are also quite mediatory anyways, right? But I think that all in all, what this means is that insofar as you have that moral obligation, like insofar as you have some level of relevance to the one of the sufferings that exists out there. And insofar as the contribution to the mitigating of that universal suffering do not fundamentally go against your right to life or these kind of basic things, then we think that your moral obligation to contribute obviously stands, and that's why we're very proud of those. Right, I thank the DLO for that fine speech and for concluding the opening half. Now I invite the member of government to begin closing half. Yeah, yeah. Um, please, I'm already brief. Yes, you are. Okay, so firstly, I'd like to dedicate this speech firstly to uh, my union, Nanda's Green University Debating Club. They are a very, very amazing support system made up of amazing debaters. Secondly, to my partner, Aristotle, who has really been doing a great job at doing this particular tour. But thirdly, um, to top boys, yeah, for continuously remaining top within the entirety of the debate circuit. But lastly, to all African debaters and judges out there that are doing the most to still ensure that the African circuit is still very much relevant, like moving on in the debating world. Uh, with that said, I'll just take like very few seconds to arrange my sheets and then I'll begin. Yeah. Okay, so I'll be beginning. I think I'm, I'm, am I still audible? Before I begin, please. Am I still audible? Yeah. Okay, cool. So I'll be beginning in three. Are you still to please do the timer thing for me? Um, I'll be beginning in three, two, one. So, panel, we think that this debate goes beyond like in you know, the real idea of whether or not we should take a particular side. That's to say, whether or not we should do one thing or the other. We think that this debate is primarily premised on whether or not it is justified, emphasis on that particular word justified, to generally like you know, prioritize one's self-interest above like, um, what is it called? Above universal um, suffering alleviation and all of those particular stuff. And it's on this particular basis that will give you our five extensions in today's debate. The very first thing that you need to understand in today's debate panel is that whilst there's a general idea that societal good in itself can only be guaranteed when universal sufferings can be alleviated. This particular concept in itself is something that just makes sense in principle. However, realistically, it is something that is very much difficult to achieve for a couple of reasons. On the first level, it is because universal suffering alleviation needs a mix of like, you know, numerical collectivization that would align specifically on the same interest to be able to achieve this particular impact. It means that you need solidarity on a large level from individuals by having them to align with the same interest for them to be able to have such impacts. This now like, you know, means two things, basically. One is that you need to undergo a coercive subtle mechanism to change individual perception on certain things. That is to say, you need a large number of conservatives before they're going to be able to like, you know, buy a leftist narrative in order to like, be able to implement good affirmative policies moving forward. You need to change like, you know, the perceptive of capitalist two ideas that will be pro fascism to be able to limit their arms on their environment. The list goes on and on as it relates to the huge amount of like, you know, huge amount of buy-ins that you need to get for you to be able to get any level of universal like alleviation buy-in. Understand how the scale we're talking about here is universal alleviation, universal. Understand how, secondly, 
the principle in itself is not something that generally sits right. Why? Because the general idea on individual rights and bodily autonomy would need to be a trade-off in Ops world. This in itself is something that is a very intrinsic part, particularly considering the fact or particularly considering the stage that we are in, but let us relate to such type progression, meaning the world in itself is in a very much usually liberalistic state that generally like prioritizes things like bodily autonomy and individual rights. All of these levels of framework tells you three things. One is that the prioritization of self-interest in itself is something that can accumulate to societal good. Once those single self-interest in themselves are in support to ideas that alleviate universal suffering. If these guys tell you that these particular guys in themselves should switch to trying to alleviate like universal suffering, but that's not the award in itself is one that will take a whole lot of time before it's going to be able to even yield any level of feasible like you know returns, particularly because of the huge amount of buy-ins that you need to get before you're able to get any level of like you know returns. Our award, however, is one that can easily even lead to that alleviation of that particular like universal suffering better than the award on that particular premise is, is justified. But that's not our award in itself does not just respect individuals' rights to pursue their own self-happiness, but also extends to alleviating universal suffering when you can enact like, you know, good policies in themselves that change individual mindsets. Beyond this, second bit of, like, what is it called? Extension that you need to get. Like, on that level of extension that generally gives you moving forward. You need to understand that the prioritization of vulnerable to other people in themselves. And then, like you now begin to join the other sufferings that generally exist. What it means is that instances where you generally prioritize other things above your self-interest, the opportunity cost is your happiness. Because contrary from what, like whatsoever, these guys want to come and tell you from up bench, people partake in self-interest, particularly because of the fact that it gives them things like happiness and other things within those particular lines. They cannot come up and fiat that says, see, trying to alleviate what suffering would most likely give you the happiness. Why? Because already I've already analyzed to you how you, you are most likely going to fail in that particular endeavor if you follow their own approach. But two, if these guys cared so much about it to the extent that they felt it would give them so much happiness, they would have engaged in it in the first instance without necessarily, like, in, in because they are rational. But this, the fact that they would have even wanted to go for their self-interest in the first instance shows you the whole idea of the kind of happiness that they get from this particular stuff. What it then means is the impact of this particular level of analysis again comes like, you know, with two like huge levels of impact. On the first level, it means that on the level of principle, it makes no sense to tell people, or it now becomes unjustified for people for you to for, tell people in themselves to or for people to take an action that goes against their self-interest. Why? Because everything literally that we do on planet Earth, even humanitarian actions and the rest of them, are things that are only valid or are only justified because they are in line with people's self-interest. The only reason why, like you know, human rights activists do that particular action is because they gain satisfaction from it, like it's still in their self-interest at the end of the day. In instances where things go against people's self-interest, it becomes unjustified for you to tell them to take such actions. But beyond that, but before I go on to the next level of impact, I'll take OO for the sake of diagonal engagement. OO, quickly. Yeah, so insofar as you say that people have a right to happiness, why is that the private people who don't have even the basic assets to pursue okay, happiness okay, or okay, any okay, of these quickly. opportunities? I, 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 why this is funny is because I'm still in this, in, on this particular clash. But then my whole analysis of this happiness also filters through to two things. One is that on the principle of responsibility and culpability, and this is where we still win open opposition on their biggest cases, why they are continuously for marking it in their POI. We think that people in themselves are responsible first to themselves. That's what that level of analysis also proves to you. We think it becomes more justified on our world because it means that this particular person is better able to feel his responsibility to himself. But secondly, even if we want to take it beyond self, we think there are people that exist within the paradigm of this guy's social cycle. That's to say, family and friends that generally care about these particular guys that tend to suffer in instances where this particular people, where this particular guy is not happy. What it means is that this guy, even if we want to concede that this guy owes some form of responsibility to alleviating universal suffering. We think he holds a stronger form of responsibility to his family and friends and those around him. We think he fails in that particular responsibility in an instance where he forgoes his self-interest, particularly since in those particular instances, it means that he will less likely to be happy. And in an instance where he's less likely to be happy, it means he's going to be sad. In an instance where he's sad, it means that those around him will not be happy. We think in the long-term effect, he becomes culpable too for whatsoever harms that comes to those particular people by they themselves not being happy. On the whole idea of probability, we think he owes like a stronger responsibility to those like you know around him. 
But fifth level of extension is that you need to understand that the idea of alleviating universal suffering in itself has been what the West, particularly people of power, used to comfortably exploit minorities. The exploitation of Africa that happened through colonization happened on the premise of universal good for the African people. It looks like bringing in things like education, bringing in things like religion, and using them to manipulate the African society. Russia's invasion on Ukraine is premised on the idea that Russia knows what is best for them and want to do it. Same thing when you went to Afghanistan and other examples in that particular line. It means that this particular stuff in itself is something that happens for three reasons. One is that the power asymmetry assumes that to achieve universal good, you need to have a certain amount of power at your disposal. This amount of power is something that this particular person does not have, meaning it's less likely going to be able to get any level of like returns on this particular ground, meaning it no longer makes sense on the level of this power. But secondly, the mechanism of achieving universal good is something that Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, we got more evidence about this. All right, all right. Thank you for that final speech. We'll invite the uh, member of opposition here. Yeah, yeah. I'll take 30 seconds. All right, so be wise verbally. Before I begin, I want to thank all my friends watching this for taking the time of the day. I want to thank Goshin, my amazing partner, who's got me all the way here. And also, given this is going to be on YouTube, I know Shire is going to watch this. Hi, Shire. I thank you for, um, you know, creating my debate career. That's an inside joke. All right. I'll prefer a PY from closing government. If I have time, that is. Uh, let me just set up my camera. All right, um, starting my speech in three, two, and one. Firstly, what does universal suffering look like? It's a basic example. We're talking about things like, you know, world hunger, like pandemics, climate change. But notice crucially what prioritization essentially looks like. Because we don't think prioritize, uh, prioritization essentially looks like. Because we don't think prioritization essentially means you're literally going to have to donate every single thing or literally, uh, you know, actively harm yourself. We're going to prove why that's not likely to be the case. What prioritization is essentially is that the fact if you're given a choice between you know, furthering your own self-interest and, you know, uh, contributing to alleviate global hunger for example you should probably you know, uh, you're probably likely to trade off your you know, furthering your own self-interest for the cause of making the world slightly better here's how we differentiate ourselves with opening opposition right because the open all stakes their case on actively contributing they stake their case on the idea that you must donate in order to alleviate global poverty i think cg i think a py by cg correctly points it out that then by by their very extent by extension of that point it will be illegal for people to not donate to charity because you know because you know you have to actively to donate, uh, uh, donate and actively contribute, you're going to be better than them because we're going to tell you that it's not simply active contribution to alleviate the crisis. It's also passively not doing more, not doing any extra harm. This is this means that that's to say we are support things, for example, like individuals vaccinated or individuals wearing masks properly or individuals, for example, not using more electricity than need. It's because there's an energy crisis going on that's harming the poor or there's global warming happening. So they're not, you know, over consuming or using cars too much, right? You can passively not, you can it can help uh, uh, alleviate a crisis by passively not doing any extra harm, which is something that opening opposition miss and offside miss as well. Government's burden is to show you not only why active contribution is something that individuals have no moral obligation to, they also have to show you why there is no passive moral obligation as well to passively alleviate the uh, uh, crisis. We have to only show one of these things is true. Government has the burden to prove both of the both of these things. So, we, so even if they fail to prove one, we still win from opposition. What is this debate about? I think this is something Dob Benz largely misses. This debate is phrase normative. That is to say, we only have to prove the normative logic behind this claim and prove that on principle a moral obligation exists. The reason why this takes out CG and OG is because we don't have to prove the world becomes a better place. We just have to prove that there is a moral obligation and it's not justified for you to prioritize your self-interest. Here's how we, add, but crucially note, we're going to address OG's first argument regarding, oh, the capacity of individuals to help. Because, for, because we think crucially that moral obligations are independent of capacity, for your capacity to do this, right? O tells you, that, that all sort of response, uh, and here's a, here I'm gonna refer back to my POI about self-defense, right? Even if there is literally no way you can win a fight against a gun if they have a stick, given the right to self-defense exists, that right is independent of the ability to actually 
fight back against the person with the gun, independent of the capacity to do so, the intuition that I prove essentially is the fact that moral obligations do not really like require you to be able to actually fulfill them insofar as the obligation exists in a vacuum, regardless of consequences, regardless of your capacity to carry out the obligation. This case also takes out CG's argumentation about, uh, CG's, uh, CG's claim about, oh, every single humanitarian deed is justified because of selfish interest. Some humanitarian deeds are justified because you owe these individuals a, a, a reparation in and of itself, regardless of your ability to do it, or regardless of the fact that it furthers your own self-interest. This takes out a large chunk of the golf bench. But crucially, you know, we want to challenge the idea that you don't have capacity to begin with. Because firstly, you don't have to donate a huge amount of money as I clarified earlier. You can donate as much as you can. But secondly, there are many, many people who can donate a lot of money, which people can donate millions. So unclear as to why the capacity is literally non-existent as, as government bench seems to assert, right? What, uh, and final clarification in terms of framing, we don't think individuals have a moral obligation to actively hurt themselves. And OSRS this, we're going to give you the analysis as to why this is true. The reason why you don't have why you don't have to hurt yourself is because we believe that every single person, regardless of who they are, have the right, have the equal value to their life. They have the equal right to pursue happiness. Assuming this is true, this means that individuals can simply avoid doing further harm to other individuals and create and exist in a neutral state of being. Notice, notice that refusing to, for example, use too much, too much cars or, for example, say Saving up on electricity doesn't harm you. It only keeps you in a neutral state of being. Well, for example, you over consuming electricity or you refuse, or, or for example, you going out in a pandemic to party with your friends only increases your self-interest and puts you in a negative state, in, in a positive state. What we simply have to support is individuals remaining in a, in a neutral state instead of inducing negative states in, uh, into yourself, which means you don't have to support individuals jumping into rivers and saving a child because if, if there's a possibility they might drown because dying and you know drowning is essentially is inducing a negative state in yourself, right? Finally, I'm going to extend of opening opposition's uh, argument about why moral obligation exists. Notice that opening opposition does a fantastic job of pointing out that you know, in many, many cases, there's been lots of individuals are, you know, morally, um, like, you know, individuals are morally complicit in causing the suffering of others. So us practicing capitalism or, or like us having voting and that sort of stuff, oftentimes is directly hurting others. They don't, however, they don't give you analysis as to why you hurting someone else necessarily means you have a moral obligation to save them because we hurt a lot of people on a regular basis, but we don't necessarily always have a moral obligation to them. The analysis behind this is firstly, the fact that these individuals oftentimes don't have the capacity capacity to help to consent into their suffering. Note that firstly, a lot of these, you know, a lot of the policies that hurt people, especially uh, tend to be global, right? For example, a country's policy to use fossil fuels hurts individuals living in coastal cities who necessarily cannot consent into it because note that through the concept of sovereignty, states limit consent by, by only limiting votes to its citizens. It means that someone living in you know, the islands of Bali is going to drown in 20 years because of climate change has no consent in the policies that, for example, the U.S. has that is exacerbating the climate change, the climate change crisis. There's a, there's a lack of consent here. But secondarily, you can't control things like companies. They oftentimes will do things like overproduce and pollute the environment, which you have no control over, which means people are inherently coerced into a form of tacit consent, which means that the suffering that that is enforced upon them is something that they have no agency towards. This, this, is, this necessarily means that if you then have a direct responsibility for another person's suffering, what logic follows is that you must be morally responsible to, to reduce that person's suffering because you induce because you infringe their rights and you induce a negative state within them so you owe them the reparatory right to in to bring them at the very least bring them back to a neutral state in which their negative in, in which the negative things that have been done to their life is mitigated and compensated for this essentially means that we are we prove to you why actually uh, prove to you essentially the, the missing link in O's analysis and tell you why there is a moral obligation for you to deprioritize your own self-interest and actually prioritize the elevation of you know like, like, you know the universal uh, suffering right but finally I'm going to deal with OG's you know last remaining standing idea about about, uh, about the fact that aha but now the state is no longer responsible simple response the state has a responsibility to save you sure but here's the intuition pump let's say you're walking by a swimming pool that's really shallow and there's a baby drowning in it sure the state has a responsibility to save the baby, but you walking by the pool also have a responsibility to save the baby. So your responsibility to help other people and reduce you know, universal suffering is not independent of the state's responsibility. Both of these, can, these things can be true simultaneously. This takes out the last remaining material from opening government. Why is this extension better? Because we proved to you the missing links from opening opposition, and we actually actively engage with Gov's best case and tell you why even on their own terms, they lose this debate. We only have to prove to you on principle individuals have a moral obligation. We don't have to show the world is a better place for all these reasons i'm proud to stand here and oppose for one last time in this tournament i i thank the member of opposition for that fine speech and now I invite the government to conclude the government case yeah yeah
Can I be heard? Yes. I can hear you. We can hear you. Okay, sure. Uh, so there are two things. Let me uh, let me just take care of this. Uh, so one, uh, keep the POIs exclusively in the text space. Don't unmute within the speech. Uh, just put the POIs in the text space. I'll be watching it. And at the point, I would decide to pick one. Secondly, there is no preferred gender pronouns and all those stuff at the end of the day. Aristotle is cool enough. Yeah, uh, third thing, uh, this debate, I would have wanted to dedicate it to my union, but I think my, my partner already dedicated it to every group that I know that I want to dedicate it at the end of the day. So I dedicate this speech to my partner, who is the reason for my debating successes so far, and also to other persons like mascot and um, a whole lot of persons that have helped me so far at the end of the day. So, Chair, I would assume I'm still audible and I'm going to start in three, two. Uh, there is a lot of noise in the background. I'm going to start in three, two, one. Let's take out OO first, because there are two basic nuances of OO's case. One, they say that people are directly or indirectly responsible to the problems of other individuals. Secondly, they try to give you an utilitarian concept. The same thing with CO. The basic entire framework of CO's case is to say there is some sort of like utilitarian framework at the end of the day. We'll show you how to break the utilitarian bubble within this debate and how our own principles still effectively wins it for us. So let's take out OO. Notice that state is a coercive structure and a paternalistic authority that expands its control to the activities of humans. It means that state is in total control of societal structures through the existence of laws. It means then that existence societal harms and historical wrongs are the direct irresponsibility of the state. Things like colonialism, imperialism, things that lead to the subjugation of every race existing within the country, existing within any country or within the world is a direct culpability of government and not individuals. But second, notice that things like climate change issues and all the rest of things that they posit is something that uh, state already knows of the harm, but they don't make laws to cope these harms. The problem then means that culpability rests on states and not individuals that exist within society. But notice there are two things that this clarification does. One, it shows you that it is principally wrong for you to put a burden on yourself, a burden that was created by a group. The, the, uh, the, the, uh, the thought experiment to explain this is that it is unjustified for you to try to protect like a whole group when you are not the person that is directly responsible for the actions affecting that particular group within this point in time. This also extends or tackles like CEO's entire argument of how people can be subtly responsible at the end of the day. But let's try to break, let's break the utilitarian bubble between both by OO and CO. Notice the first thing, right? That thread off that for you to argue about utilitarianism, the first question you have to ask is whether thread offs are the thread offs that you want to make is something that is agreeable for persons existing within that group. Notice that people are hotwired to cater for themselves, right? And to be well off. But notice that the alleviation of suffering is something that requires organizations and people to help you in the vast majority of instances so that you can get any net utilitarian impact. And this is where I have a problem with CO. They tell you that helping one person is just good enough. The problem with that particular argumentation is to say that utilitarianism as a principle prioritizes the greatest number of people possible. You can't argue for a universal mechanism by just taking care of a single person. That is intellectually dishonest, but also principally wrong. But notice then that people, due to their perverse incentive to cater for themselves, would not care about such utilitarian impact. It means then that you cannot garner people to protect, to give the greatest happiness or the greatest number possible. Why is this important? Notice that utilitarianism as a principle 
is only good enough a principle when it can provide outcomes that is better than what is existent within status quo. If you take care of just one person, you are, there is zero delta impact for the suffering of black people, state, black people existing within the US for like uh, uh, other people that suffer from racial things and all the rest of that. But let's extend or break, let's extend breaking the utilitarian principle within this debate. The first question you have to ask yourself is whether happiness is the greatest measure of alleviating suffering. Notice that alleviation of suffering is something that takes people in groups, in a tag. I'm not, consi I'm not consider the basic or specific nuances of people within that particular regard and what constitutes their happiness. This is wrong on two levels. One, it means that you bundle people up as a group, give them a tag and try to provide benefit without trying to know what constitutes their own individual specific happiness. But secondly, it also means it also means that it also means that some people benefit from their suffering. The intuition pop is simple. Notice there are women that benefit from things like patriarchy, and also there are black people in political spaces that uh, uh, that you know get benefit from the suppression of the black body. It means then principally that you try to provide an utilitarian impact, but the happiness of this what you think as the happiness of these people is not essentially what it is at the end of the day. The utilitarian like bubble is breaking within this debate. But let's show you why we clearly differentiate from our opening and why we effectively win this debate. Notice the principle that my partner effectively tells you. There are two things he tells you. One, the entire concept of dignity which ties to responsibility of people within this particular regard. Notice that resources in themselves are finite and structures within states and structures and state is micro political, right? It means that these people are selfish to themselves, right? This means that states and society and people is ever ready to limit your dignity and your self-sustenance. It means then that you owe a duty to yourself to protect yourself in, to protect yourself in, term, in terms of retaining your personhood, right? Why is this important? Because it means that when you have an incentive to try to protect a large amount of people, you leave yourself vulnerable to societal mechanisms that are always willing to take you down. But notice the next sort of thing. Humans are always on a hedonistic treadmill. The hedonistic treadmill here is to say that humans are always on the treadmill to try to acquire success in themselves and for themselves. It means that, that when you try to cut up for other people, you take your, you give an incentive for people to push you out of this hedonistic treadmill and try to get like personal benefit for themselves. Notice something here, Chair. There are three things within this debate. We have already distinct, distinctively showed you how we do not care about what the entire thing that OG argues about visibility. We have showed you in terms of principle how this is wrong. But secondly, we have showed you how utilitarian as a principle is only good when it can solve existing societal problems. The same reason this principal analogy extends uh, to things like self-defense. Self-defense is only good a principle where you can provide like better outcomes than the problem that is existing within society. We have never been prouder to come from CG because we clearly show you the principles of responsibility and how you cannot use yourself as an opportunity cost to cater for more people existing within society and how you also have a responsibility for other persons existing with you. But let's talk about the last sort of chat within this debate. Let's weigh in on the entire issue of visibility, though I don't think that is a necessary argument. Given that people do not, okay, oh, oh. Do I still have time? Out of order. Okay, sure. So let's talk about the last sort of thing. Notice that on two levels, that utilitarianism, that people should create the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people, talks about numbers. CO can't continue to thrive on the entire idea that if you stop or you take a baby out of water, that that is good enough to alleviate like universal suffering. The thought experiment on their side is quite lousy. We think that utilitarianism as a principle is only good enough when it provides like better outcomes at the end of the day. Never be proud of to stand on such. Record anything other than that, I advise you to take points of information. I welcome opposition with here. Yeah. Hi, uh, am I audible? Yes, you're audible. Okay, I will take uh PY's via voice. You are uh, free, you're free to unmute yourself at any point in time and ask me a PY if I don't ask you one already. Okay, uh, before I start the speech, I'd like to dedicate this to my teammate, Robia, who has been my source of inspiration for um, 
pursuing a career in for furthering my career in debate and also to practice MUNs. If you guys are seeing this, hi as well as GDS. All right, I'll be starting my speech in three, two, one. I think this debate gets extremely messy by the time I'm about to give you my speech, right? We tell you very simple things. Government's burden is to prove that people don't have a moral obligation to anybody else other than themselves and that you don't owe anybody anything, right? They have to defend not only actively harming other people, but also passively harming other people by pursuing things out of their own self-interest. Like this, this looks like things like ent why entertainment, your own entertainment or turning on the AC is more important than another person's right to have a safe health, than another person's right to not suffer from climate change. Now, the way I'm gonna be structuring my speech is first off, I'll take down CG, then I'll take down OO, lastly, take down OG. And at the very end of my speech, I'll be talking about the burdens that we fulfill. What do you get from CG? CG tells you that universal that in order for you to alleviate universal suffering, you need solidarity at a large level to make a meaningful impact. They don't show us exactly why. So uh, they, they don't give us analysis as to why one single person cannot bring about meaningful impact. We tell you this is not true, right? You as an individual you will, can still have enough resources to do a lot, be it actively or be it passively, right? A very clear, simple example of this is a rich person donating a lot of money to a poor family to ensure that they have enough money to last themselves, um, to last meals for themselves for a month, right? Even if you, even if you think even if you assume that you as an individual cannot make a direct meaningful impact, we still think you have an obligation to do so on the premise that all humans are made equal, right? And on the premise that we as a species have a duty to do others because we want to do others as we want to be done on, unto ourselves, right? Because we understand that other people, the reason why we are here today is because other people have made sacrifices for ourselves as well. The second problematic argumentation that CG brings us to us is that op the opportunity cost is your happiness, right? And, uh, and that everything we do is out of your own self-interest. They make, this is an extremely broad claim to make, right? That your, that your right to happiness is a lot more important than another person's right to alleviate to be alleviated, alleviated out of their own suffering, right? If you're gonna make such a broad frame, please show us how this is true. We also, we, how, however, we tell you how this is not true, right? There still exist people who do things not, who, who do a lot of things that are not directly out of self-interest, right? They need to show us why someone who did, donates 50% of their net worth to poor people is not doing it out of their self-interest, right? They also tell us that we are not responsible for the suffering caused to others and that this is the, passing the motion means putting on an unfair burden on yourself to alleviate the suffering that was created by another group, right? The actors that they characterize to us look like things like capitalists, colonialists, etc., right? Universal actors whose suffering whose suffering affect a large group of people. If they are causing the suffering of somebody in your proximity that you can help, they are probably causing the suffering of you as well, right? They, they, the problem that stands in the status quo caused by these actors are shared experiences. In virtue of that shared experiences, you have a moral obligation to help that person out. Even if we assume that you don't have the responsibility, we still think you have the we still think you have an obligation to help your brother out on the premise that you are in a position to do so, right? On the premise that you are not causing active harm on your side, right? Because you we assume that you are on the on the sort of position where you have the time and the resources to help that person out. And if you were to make a trade-off where you where you maybe make a small sacrifice to not go to a restaurant, to not go to a party, to not buy something expensive, if that means that it's alleviating somebody else's pain, we think you have the principal justification to do so, right? Because that is nothing but fair, right? They, the third thing that the uh, closing government gives you is that resources are finite, people are inherently selfish, they're hotwired to be selfish, and therefore you owe the resources to yourself. Again, our entire case talks about redistribution of resources and happiness because we think the point in time this motion can be passed is the point in time in which another person deserves that resource or that happiness a lot more than you do. A poor person deserves a $20 note way more than somebody who's already rich. So when CG comes up and tells us is you need to hoard these resources for yourself, we tell you that no, maybe somebody else deserves that $20 note a lot more than you do and that therefore it is principally just justified for you for you uh, therefore it is principally uh, you are obligated to do that help for that person 
Okay, why do we take over opening opposition? Opening opposition case is incredibly tight because it relies on you actively donating or helping others, right? Whereas in our case, we win by a broader margin. We tell you that you don't necessarily have to actively provide sh food and shelter to people. We tell you that all you need to do is make sure you curb your self-interest and a passive result of that is that you alleviate another person's suffering. How is this true? Take an example. In the COVID pandemic situation, you can either choose to stay at home or to, um, I, I, I just choose to go stay at home or to go to a party, um, to have fun. You going to the party would mean that you are putting other people at risk and harming them. Harming them. Where in the, in the other scenario, you can choose to stay at home, which puts you in a net neutral position. Doing the very least means that you are reducing the risk for somebody else. We're not telling you that you have to actively donate to COVID research. You choosing a net neutral position also helps alleviate other people's suffering, be it tacitly, be it actively. That is uh, because of the broader margin, we take this case overall, right? Because our case is a lot more flexible. We win over them, over themselves, right? They assert that moral obligation exists, but they don't analyze this. Robia comes up and does it for them, which is, which is what brings about our unique extension. Um, all right, moving on to OG. OG tells you, um, OG, OG tells a lot of their time explaining how self-interest is isn't exactly things like corruption, terrorism, etc., which is time wasted because we win this debate without having to prove those things. Anyway, they tell us that you don't have to solve the problems because you are not the root cause of the problem, which is which again CG tries to extend on but does a uh, but does a poor job at doing so because we follow the debate within these metrics. Okay. When I see a little kid drowning in a swimming pool, I don't stop to think whether or not I caused the kid to drown. There is an intuition within me that makes uh, that makes me want to help that kid, right? Because the kid's right to survive weighs a lot more than my right to say not be late for work, right? Which is why we think when you weigh the two options, you you it is principally justified for you because you have the capacity to help this person out. This is a direct rebuttal to their argument about how the, you, you, you like this is bad for the government because you're attacking the relevance in society. This debate takes place on the framework of you having that capacity but to alleviate suffering, right? Understand this understand the asymmetry that happens in this debate. This debate takes place in two scenarios in a scenario where you have two choices, and the baseline is that you are in a neutral position. We don't think you necessarily have to put yourself at active risk in order to help other person right you have a billion dollars you can choose to give this money to a homeless person by giving them a thousand dollars you are now a thousand dollars short sure but comparatively this doesn't harm you as much as the homeless person will be harmed if they do not get the money all right this debate is on trade-offs and whether or not you choosing to make the trade-off is justified whether or not you really matter more than thousands of other people for you to pursue your short, your self-interest if you are entitled to a good time, other people are even more entitled to a life free of suffering. We must minimize suffering and provide the most help to the greatest number of people because helping those in need will reduce such suffering. For all these reasons, very proud to oppose. All right, I thank the opposition for that fine speech and for everyone else for their good speeches. Now the judges will take about 15 to 20 minutes deliberating. So you guys can go back to the main rooms and I don't know whatever you choose to do, but otherwise, thank you. It was a great finals. Good.